Dad, please take the time to seriously sit down and think about what I am writing you. I know I haven't talked to you about our family situation, but it has come to a point where I can't stand it anymore. Ever since the day you left, I have a, had a big change in my life. I don't get to see you much, and when I do, it is a, it is for a short time. We are ready for you to come home. I wish you would give it another try, and give Mom another chance to try and work out things. Things won't get better unless both of you try. There would be no greater day than the day you came home and rejoined our household and put our family back together. Please think this over because we really need you back. But he never came home. Instead, he chose to end the marriage. It's not what I wanted, but that's the route he took. I never thought in a million years I would be divorced. We had a role model family. The children did well in school. We were well known in the community. I thought it happened to other families. I never dreamed that I'd be sitting in the chair today talking about this. People try to run away to other things, other people, drugs, alcohol, to try to fix their issues. But the best thing is to stay and try to work it out. The grass is never greener on the other side, even though people think that it might be. I can tell you that it's not. The children especially suffer. They have to go to two family gatherings on holidays. They have to see the other person in the relationship. It's always difficult. They can suffer from emotional trauma. They can get involved in things themselves out of hurt and pain. Again, it's just never worth splitting a family. But if you're already divorced, there is hope. God has a plan for you. In Jeremiah 29, 11, the word says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you and to give you hope. And I can testify to this because after healing through divorce, God has opened many doors for me and many opportunities in ministry, in, um, in my writing, in the things that I'm gifted in. And I can tell you that God has a plan for you too. The truth is I would love to be married again, but if that doesn't happen, I'm okay because as long as I'm submitting to God's will, that's what's important and that's what makes you whole and that's what brings you joy. Hebrews 8, 12 says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that if a man or woman is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. God can make everything brand new. Sure. It may not be what once was his ideal plan from the beginning, but he is able to recreate, reshape, regenerate, and give us a fresh new start with hope. I love what the daughter of Billy Graham, Ruth Graham, said just the other day at his funeral. I don't know if you saw that or not, but it was a fitting tribute. But it was the perfect picture of what God does with that type of brokenness. This is what she said. I have my own Billy Graham story. 
So I'm going to tell you that one. And I've told it many times, and some of you have maybe heard it many times. But it bears repeating because, to me, it speaks to the essence of who my father was and is. After 21 years, my marriage ended in divorce. I was devastated. I floundered. I did a lot wrong. The rug was pulled out from under me. My family thought it'd be a good idea for me to move away, to get a fresh start somewhere else. So I decided to live near my older sister and her family and near a good church. The pastor of that church introduced me to a handsome widower and we began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but I thought, you know, they were almost grown. They didn't know what they could, they couldn't tell me what to do. I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo. They said, honey, why don't you slow down? Let us wait to get to know this man. They had never been a single parent. They had never been divorced. What did they know? So being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married a man, this man, on New Year's Eve. And within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. What was I going to do? I wanted to go talk to my mother and my father. It was a two-day drive. Questions swirled in my mind. What was I going to say to Daddy? What was I going to say to Mother? What was I going to say to my children? I'd been such a failure. What were they going to say to me? You, we, we're tired of fooling with you. We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. And let me tell you, you women will understand you don't want to embarrass your father. You really don't want to embarrass Billy Graham. <laughs> and many of you know that we live on the side of a mountain. And as I wound myself up the mountain, I rounded the last bend in my father's driveway, and my father was standing there waiting for me. As I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he said, welcome home. There was no shame, there was no blame, there was no condemnation, just unconditional love. And you know, my father was not God, but he showed me what God was like that day. When we come to God with our sin, our brokenness, our failure, our pain and our hurt, God says, welcome home. And that invitation is open for you. Isn't that powerful? God's grace and mercy If the family of Billy Graham cannot be spared from brokenness and dysfunction, then who among us can stand but by the grace of God? Hallelujah. It's powerful words from Ruth Graham, but I want you, I want to redirect you powerful words from Ann Wayne. Earlier this week when I was <clears throat> asking her about we were going to record that video, she stood outside my office <coughs> and we talked a bit about that time period in her life. And She said, you know, the thing that struck me most, she said, you know, people always get into trouble in their marriage and they run they run to other people, they run to the beach, they run to this thing or that thing. And the grass is never greener. Pause. From someone who is <clears throat> on that side, she is redirecting attention to those of us who are still in marriage and you may be in the struggle sometimes in our marriage we we look up and we go the grass is dormant everything is brown 
It is the winter of my marriage. But over there, there's such green, lush pasture. I can smell it. I can see it. I want that. And so we run, thinking, leaving that behind for that which we think will be better. And from someone who's over there, she says, don't come over here. I know what you think, what you see, but it's not what it is. It's not greener than where you are. As one who is here, I'm telling you, if there's any ounce, any shred, even a moment, even a minute, even a second, even a last fight, stay here. Because the fight to make your grass green again, whatever it takes, is worth the fight and better than what you think is over here. So if there's any fight in you left, I don't care how many times he or she has done it, what they've done, it's worth the fight. The grass is not greener. That is profound Ann Wayne theology. It's profound because it's biblical theology. So you're sitting there today and you're probably left thinking, especially if you've been here the last two weeks. All right. I guess I got two options then. I can either divorce and I can be miserable and I can feel all of that pain and that separation totally rip my family apart. Okay, that's one option. Or I can stay. But you don't know how difficult this is. What I wake up to every day. And so I'll just stay and I'll be miserable, but I'll be holy. God, you just got to help me suffer through to the end. That's probably the two options you're thinking about. But there are actually, there is actually one other option. God gives us a third biblical option in Ephesians 5. And that third option is stay in your marriage. Get in the battle and make it great. And when you do that, you will find the green again but it all begins with one word that word submit surrender submit makes people cringe right most of that cringing comes from not understanding what that word means. But right there in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21, it says submit to one another, or submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And before we go into what submit means, let's start with the end of that verse, out of reverence for Christ. Because this verse, where it comes in that passage is a transition verse. And what that means is it connects one part of the passage to the other part of the passage. Previous to this, it talks about what it means to live a wise life, to not be foolish. And in that, he says several things. He says, being filled with the Holy Spirit, singing hymns and psalms to one another, thanking God and then submitting to one another and then that bridges over to this talk about husbands and wives parents and children he says slaves and masters which in our day would be employers and employees 
But it begins, it hinges, the hinge, the connector is this submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because you see, ultimately, it boils down to our relationship with God. We want to we jump to making it about our relationship with another person. But it all begins with our relationship to the Lord. You see, the truth is, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we should be submitting ourselves to the Lord. And when we do, it changes the relationships around us. We want the greener grass. Option three is stay in your marriage and make it great. You don't have to leave. You don't have to stay and be miserable. You can stay and make it great. But where does it begin? It begins with a relationship with the Lord. Submitting to him out of reverence to him. Our relationships built upon our relationship with him. That's why I don't know I have this black bracelet on it actually never leaves my wrist There's a red one too, but that's not today's sermon black one It says I am second What does that mean? Well, it's a constant reminder right there on my wrist The bill is not number one Bill is not in control. Bill's life, every part of it, relationships, activities, work, thoughts, speech, every bit of it has to begin with submission to Jesus Christ as the one and only. Fifteen months ago, I thought my life was over. I thought my marriage was over. I would lose my family. And I was sitting in the living room with my wife and just falling apart. I really don't know why she was even there still with me. We were on our knees, knelt down. She said, you think you're saved? Like, I don't know. I thought I was. I grew up in church, knew about the Bible, knew about Jesus, but I didn't feel saved. I felt separated and ashamed and full of guilt and full of fear. Tormented, just tormented. spent an entire lifetime struggling with temptation. I have struggled with alcohol. I have struggled with sex, um, pornography at a very young age. You know, struggling with that, even as a newly married guy, you know, those temptations and those thoughts. And seven years in our marriage, you know, I struggled with infidelity and it almost ended our marriage then. And then I got sober, and thought that would fix everything. All the other stuff would stop as well, you know? And just eventually going down the path I was and the more success I got with my career, the more I thought I could have what I wanted and do what I wanted to do. I created this dual life, lust, no matter who they were or where I was, you know, I could be in church. I entered into a relationship outside of my marriage with someone, I'm a bad person. <laughs> you know, I kept my wife in the dark about everything. I was there, but I wasn't there. I was present, but not present. That in itself led to me starting to branch out and want to start up other things with other women, the sexting and the, all, the, all, all that started up. Um, with random people that I didn't even know. I was convinced I'm gonna leave my wife. I'm gonna leave my kids. But now I'm in so deep, I don't know what to do. I'm sunk. This is like sociopath stuff, you know? This is like crazy. Oh, I can't even. Uh...
I was just a dead person. I was. I had run out of lies. And my wife figured out what was going on. I've read that infidelity is the next to the death of a child, the worst pain. It's so painful. You're in this pit and you don't see that there's You don't feel like there's any way out. And, and then you'd have to tell your kids. Infidelity, we have dealt with that. Dave knows what that brings in a relationship. He knows how much pain that causes. It is so hard to believe that anybody could come home to their family and look at them and lie to them like he did. that tough time of not really knowing what we were going to do, of her not knowing what she was going to do. You know, we had a lot of friends that said, you know, you should leave him. You are going to leave him, right? And we had a few that were not so quick to go there. They were, you know, God can do anything. It was several, two or three weeks before my wife and I ended up on our knees in our living room. As painful as it was, as, as heartbreaking as it was, I still knew that I would be committed to my marriage vows. I knew I had to forgive him and I was gonna have to walk out that forgiveness. She chose to honor God and to honor our marriage by fighting for it, rather than walking away. Dave and I were on our knees in our living room. And she started praying for me and then prayed with me. At that moment, I had the opportunity to, uh, to give my life away, finally. That was the night that I asked God to come to me right where I was and to rescue me and get me out of this pit that I was in. And uh, I thought I had to tell him what a wreck and what a mess I was and he already knew. And, uh, took me as I was. That's all I really wanted, for somebody to just take me the way I was. Even though I was in the throes of all that pain and hurt and brokenness, once we opened our eyes, I knew something had changed in Dave. He saw the beauty of the Christ for the first time. To do somebody completely one way and then turn around and, and do you completely the opposite. I 
guess that's what God does with us, you know? I guess that's what grace is. We get what we don't deserve. My name is Dave Robbins, and I am second. It begins with submission to Christ. Out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So what does that word submit really mean? Well, it means to subject yourself to one another, to, to, to come under another person. But it begins with God. It's, it's, it, there's a sense in which submitting means coming under God's arrangement. Coming under God's design. Coming under God's will. In fact, just a little bit previous to this, in chapter 5, he says, know the will of God. This is part of the will of God. That we submit to one another. We come under his arrangement. We're not questioning. We're not designing. We're not creating. We say, God, you set it up this way. Therefore, I'm going to submit to you. And the way I'm doing that is by submitting to one another. I think a good explanation of what that submission is means to one another is found in Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 it says do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others and actually, verse 5 says, have the same mind in you or attitude as that is within Christ Jesus. And he there outlines the humility of Christ who was above all, but humbled himself to death on a cross. You see, the truth is that submitting to one another means that we consider others as more significant than us. Now, I know we live in, a, we live in an age today where uh, self-esteem is highly valued think well of yourself you know you are your own boss that's why we cringe at submission you ought to be in control and all that but the truth is the truth is that our self-esteem is not found in ourselves it's more of a Christ esteem see we shouldn't think highly of ourselves we should think highly of Christ and the Christ we think highly of loves us and gave himself for us. If you can't find significance in that, I promise you, there's nothing in this world that will give you significance. The grass is not greener in the other field. Our role, our task, option three, is make the grass green right where we are. And what that means is for one another, for husbands and wives, it begins with submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Option three is on the table. Option three is achievable. But it begins with submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. My first wife died in 2002, she was my high school sweetheart. Um, she passed away from a reaction to a medication that she had taken, uh, leaving me with two children the age of uh, 10 and four. At that time, I had no desire or even consideration to ever be married again. I would never had a desire to be married because I didn't want to be that vulnerable or um, put myself in a situation where I could allow um, someone into my heart to hurt me. The marriage was really um, rocky because I, I felt like I was sort of a visitor in this home. Um, it was my home and I had shared the same last name but I didn't share the DNA and it was for me almost palpable and um, oftentimes when there would be arguments or disagreements with, um, within our home the silence was deafening for me. There was no communication. I mean, uh, and the longer the marriage went on, the, the, the less communication there was. I mean, you know, remembering back, they were, we would go for probably days and not 
speak to each other in the same home. And, uh, you know, there was no infidelity, no cheating, anything like that in the marriage. It was just, there was just nothing. I made the decision to move out because I just could not continue living in an empty, numb marriage. And my son, our son, my stepson was graduating. And my goal was as soon as he graduated, then I would be gone. But I knew that June 1st, the day I was moving into my apartment, I knew that day that I shouldn't do it. And um, Don was leaving for work and he came to tell me goodbye. And he said, I know when I come home, um, a lot of your things will be gone and you won't be here. Um, and he knelt down beside the bed where I was and he prayed with me. And um, he was crying and I started crying and, and I knew in my heart that I shouldn't be leaving. But I'd already paid for this apartment and, and so I, I moved and I moved out. Well, when Wendy moved out again, prior to that, um, I had met with Mark at a, at a church near our house on the, the ninth anniversary, the day of our ninth anniversary. And um, things had gotten really bad. So at that point, you know, I had just surrendered uh, to God and, and was going to do whatever He wanted me to do. I had surrendered to God and just whatever He wanted me to do um, to change my life and, and, you know, save my marriage, I was willing to do. And, you know, praying was, was something that was uncomfortable, uncomfortable for me, but, but it was what I knew I needed to do. So he was not the man that I married. He was humble and and just godly. He was a total, totally different person, which inspired me to surrender my life and rededicate my life to Christ. And and when you have those two together, um, it's just it was a powerful, powerful thing for us to to um, to work with. So when I moved out, there was a lot of tears, of course, on both of our parts. But I never saw Don cry that much in our marriage. Um, even when his father passed away, I didn't see that many tears. And when I moved out and, and our marriage was broken and he was sincerely just heartbroken, I didn't even realize he, he loved me that much. Um, I had no idea he loved me that much. And when I realized it and when I saw the surrender, um, I just, I wanted to, to work on our marriage and, and, and give my life back to Christ and, and, and just work through our marriage that way. We put God first in everything. And before, you know, he was, you know, he, he was in the back seat or on the back burner, so to speak. I mean, but, but we made a commitment to God and to each other to put God first and, and, and have a, a prayer life and, and study and, and all the things that, that needed to go in to make a, a, a marriage. When we committed to putting God first in our marriage, that's when our marriage just took off and it, it gave feet to the words of getting back together. Things in our, with our marriage now compared to the first nine years are just completely different. Um, we, there's joy in our marriage. We enjoy each other's company. We, have, um, we love being involved in church together. And just, it's a heart to heart thing. We know, we know where Christ is in our lives and, and, and we pray together and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Every day's a struggle, but there's no doubt about where I need to be. And there's no doubt about it that He's not forever. You know what's so cool about that story is um, <clears throat> I remember talking with them when um, there was nothing. I remember um, meeting with Don in the church parking lot and I remember uh, Wendy saying she was moving out coolest part about all that is um, sitting here Thursday night watching them 
And uh, for me, watching Wendy and the way she looked at Don. God can do anything. Many of you are here today and you're saying, I would just love to look at my spouse that way again. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Jesus said in Luke 18, 27, what is impossible for us is possible with God. But it all begins with surrender. So Father, in every heart today, and I mean, Lord, it's we come in here and we put up walls because we don't want anybody to see just how fractured we are. But God, I pray there's anybody here today who's broken in some way, whether it be their marriage, maybe they're on the last breath, today is the day. And I want to say to you, church, some of you are you probably saying, I can't do it, I can't do it. That's the point. You throw up your hands and you just surrender. That's the starting point. That's the turning point where you stop trying and you start dying to self and letting the life of Christ come alive in you and your marriage. So extend an invitation to you today. If your marriage is on its last leg, here's the equation. Submit. Surrender. Start there.